Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfell. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. Um, delighted to have you join me as we're taking this journey together, this journey of following Jesus on the road to the cross, and then eventually as well to the empty tomb. You know, when it comes to the story about the cross, I don't know about you, but I, I found that there are so many people confused about what Jesus was up to. I have here before me one, uh, you know, very famous writer uh, who thought that Jesus went around announcing the kingdom of God, which of course is true. Uh, but then in his estimation, the kingdom of God was simply the end of evil, beginning of righteousness. And then Jesus looked around and realized people were rejecting him and it wasn't going to happen. And so in disillusionment, he resolutely set his face to Jerusalem and died. And so I guess the lesson that you learn from that is it's better to die with your dreams uh, than to give up on them and just simply live like the jaded rest of us. <laughs> but, you know, that's a strange view. And here I have another view uh, of, a, of another uh, more contemporary preacher who said, you know, the cross means suffering to achieve your goals. And the resurrection means that good goals simply can't die. <laughs> oh, that sounds so contemporary. But on the other hand, what has that got to do with what Jesus was actually up to? And so one of the things I've been trying to do here with this journey to the cross is to set Jesus in the context in which the events that we read about actually happen. And to ask ourselves, not you know, from a contemporary perspective, you know, what do we think of them, but to really come to terms with what the events actually meant. So I've been saying that, that Jesus entered into this period of the cross at the onset of the Jewish Passover. And Passover was a part of a wider Jewish feast, which was called the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, was a remembrance, not only that God had given a deliverance from slavery to ancient Israel, but also that when the deliverance came, when the doors were suddenly opened and they could leave Egypt and never go back to slavery again, that they were to make bread without leaven. That is, you wouldn't have enough time for the dough to rise. In other words, the deliverance of God comes so quickly, the bread is actually called the bread of haste. I mean, you want to quickly grab something to eat, but then you want to be on your way. You don't want to linger any longer. God's deliverance is upon us. So this Feast of Unleavened Bread was a remembrance that when God rescued, when God saves, when God gives his great, wonderful events, when God enters into our experience, that he does so suddenly, unexpectedly, and that we need to be ready for him. So that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when Israel celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what you would want to do in preparation for the entire Passover celebration, uh, you would go through your house and uh, symbolically look at, you know, in every cupboard, you know, <laughs> under every shelf, I mean, wherever you would, and you would symbolically send members of your house looking for leaven because you want to remove all leaven from your house. A and this removing of leaven from your house over history, it started to take upon itself a new meaning. It was the bread of haste and God's deliverance suddenly, but it also took upon itself other, you know, symbolism. So, for instance, the prophet Hosea would speak about idolatry as leaven because, you know, idolatry seems to seep through everything in your culture and it was pervasive. And so, you know, the idolatry of leaven, I'm mean, sorry, the, the leaven of idolatry the other way around. Uh, Amos, the prophet, speaks about it in a similar way. He recounts Israel's sin and then after they sin, uh, then, uh, he says Amos, uh, this, they offered uh, to the Lord, he says, leavened bread. That is, you know, in their sin, they kept on doing their offerings, but they never did it with a new heart. I mean, there was always something deeply sinister going on in their hearts, even while they were pretending to worship. So this is a part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the idea of leaven in Passover, it becomes a symbol of remaining evil. Uh, preparing for Passover, taking the leaven out of your house was a symbol of genuine repentance before God and seeking holiness, seeking a new heart, looking for things to be made new so that you could present yourself before God and wait for his deliverance. So I've been talking about Palm Sunday and Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and uh, he shows 
uh, Israel that he is indeed their Messiah who has come to deliver them, but not so much from the slavery of Roman occupation, but rather from the slavery of sin and their alienation from God. So Palm Sunday has happened, and now it's Monday. And Monday marks the day in which Christ's journey to the cross shows us that this journey does demand a new heart. Leaven has to be removed. So Jesus spent the night back in Bethany after you know, the, the riotous events, if you will, of, of Palm Sunday. And, uh, and so it's Monday now, and he's back that three-kilometer journey back to Bethany. He spends the night there, and then in the morning of Monday, he goes back to Jerusalem. This time, unlike the day before, there are no crowds lining the way. He's already made that grand entrance. Now he just comes rather unobtrusively into the city. Mark tells us on this morning that he was hungry. So why hadn't he eaten? And we just don't know. Uh, But uh, at any rate, uh, Mark tells us that he comes upon a fig tree that is in leaf. So it's um, still some distance from the temple, and he sees this fig tree standing there. He goes and looks for figs, and finding none, he curses that tree. Now, Mark adds a curious phrase here. He says, uh, it was not the season for figs. So you think, well, if it's not fig season, and You know, I mean, those of us who don't live in that part of the world don't know when fig season is, but clearly it wasn't. And uh, so you say, why is he even looking for figs when it's not the the season for figs? Uh, Well, and the other thing is, I mean, why is Jesus so angry that he curses the tree? I mean, what did the, the tree ever do to him? So you've got some people who say, well, you know, Jesus clearly hadn't eaten, so his, you know, his temper was on edge and he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing and that kind of stuff. But I'm going to say there's something deeply symbolic in what he's doing here, and it's connected to this idea that it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Matthew, when he tells this story of Jesus cursing the fig tree, says the, the tree withered at once. And Mark, when you read his account, it makes it sound as if it only withered the next day, that is on Tuesday. But the two accounts, I think, can easily be harmonized, so it must have been clear that the tree immediately died when Jesus spoke a curse on it, and the next day when they came there, that the leaves were already fallen and the whole thing was withered and dried up. And so, you know, those two events... Uh, are easily harmonized with each other. At any rate, why in the world does he do this? Now, we know it's, you know, late March or early April. And it's true that, that figs wouldn't be on these trees for probably, you know, another six weeks. And um, so, you know, we, we might say, well, what's going on? And now I don't know anything about fig trees, so I had to do a lot of reading about them. And so I understand that a fig tree leafs out and gets in bud during this time of the year when Jesus was there. And uh, it has a kind of a bud which the Hebrews called a pagim. Now this pagim, uh, it's, they also called it early figs. And uh, you could break off these, these little buds and you could actually eat them. I understand they taste fairly bland. So they're not the figs that you wanted or figs really at all. Uh, They're called, however, by some early figs. So clearly Jesus was going to the fig tree looking for this bud that was there, and he finds none. So clearly there's something wrong with that tree. It's not ready to give, you know, eventually to leaf out into, into figs. It doesn't even have the buds on it. And so he stands back and curses it. Now, why does he do that? Well, I want to take you back to an earlier time in Jesus' ministry, and this was a time in which he tells a parable, and the disciples would have remembered this parable, so here goes. Uh, the parable is taken from Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. And a man, a man had a fig tree, says Jesus, and planted his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear no fruit next year, well, then fine and good. But if not, uh, you can cut it down. So the whole idea here is that that Jesus is, is, in a way, he's, he's acting out something that he said earlier. And what I'm going to say is that we know that Jesus, when he visits Jerusalem here, it's now the third time that he's visited it. So in a sense, he's acting out 
the fig tree. So uh, let me take a step back and ask, when Jesus does this, the fig tree must represent something. And I know that there are some people that say, well, a fig tree must represent uh, the nation of Israel, that Jesus is cursing the nation. But nowhere in the, in, the writings of, or in the writings about Jesus do we find Jesus doing anything even close to that. And so I'm going to say that the fig tree represents the temple. This is now the third time that Jesus has visited the temple, and all three times he finds them as if they are a house with leaven left in it. There's all things that are deeply impure, and he's been waiting. He's making proclamations about the temple. He's warning the worshipers of the temple, and especially the Jewish religious leaders, that they need to repent of their sins. He's digging around the fig tree, if you will, and hoping for it to produce figs, but he comes back on this occasion and finds the temple just as corrupt as it always was. So that's the context. Well, let's remember again that Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem the day before, that was Palm Sunday. He went into the temple, he had a look around, and then he goes to Bethany. The next day it's Monday, and that's the day we're talking about today. And according to Mark, he goes back into the temple, and on this day, he's gonna create sheer pandemonium in the temple. I mean, before it's done, everybody is shouting and wondering, what in the world is the man doing? So from my vantage point, what Jesus is doing in cursing the fig tree is he's setting the stage for what he's about to do in the temple. He is about to say the entire system of worship in the temple is corrupt. Uh, He is when he says, may no one eat fruit from you again, which he says to the fig tree, that's what he's saying to the temple. I am going to forbid people from coming to you to worship again. So that's the whole idea behind it. And so today, again, let's understand what day we're talking about. It's Monday, and Jesus' disciples don't understand what he's going to do. They leave the fig tree. He's killed that tree with a single word, and he walks now to the Mount of Olives, and he heads straight to the temple, the place where he has been the day before. Now, the temple's this massive complex. I've I've made mention of that before. It's large. And in the center of the temple, there's a place called the Holy of Holies, which was only open for the priests to go into once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. It was considered that this was a symbol of the very dwelling place of God on earth. Now, around the uh, Holy of Holies, there's a larger court, and this was also called the, the Court of Men, but it was also the court where sacrifice would happen. So Jewish men would watch as sacrifices would happen. And so, especially now it's Passover, you would have you know, all the sheep and everything else being brought. You know, uh, as I've mentioned, some 250,000 being sacrificed during Passover. And so people would be there to watch and participate. Then outside of that court was something called the Court of Women. And all of those courts were enclosed behind a wall. And it's all of those courts that I've just described that would form what we would call the temple complex. Now, surrounding the temple complex is a large open area. It's kind of like a large outdoor courtyard. And surrounding this courtyard is a railing with a screen. And then there are steps that go down to a lower court below that. Now, what's interesting is if you were to go up the steps, there would be a sign there. And the sign would indicate that any Gentile who dared to go into the upper court and approach the temple, that the temple guards would immediately shoot them with arrows. In other words, they kill you on the spot. If you go beyond this and you're a Gentile, the sign would say, you have only yourself to blame for your death. So that's how worship happened. I mean, Gentiles were kept out. Jews were given their place, women over here, men over here, sacrifice over here. So that's the idea that I want us to say. No Gentile was allowed to even come close to the place of sacrifice. Now, I want to also say a couple of other things that happened around this temple. So one, the Gentiles were kept out, which is the greater part of the human race. Uh, The other part that I want us to understand is that of the sheep that were being sacrificed, according to the law of Moses, you could only sacrifice sheep that did not have a blemish. 
so there was never to be a broken bone or any deformity on the sheep. And in order to ensure that only healthy sheep were sacrificed, the priests were called upon to examine each sheep. And here's where there was a lot of corruption. Um, you know, let's imagine that you lived in the Galilee and you had some sheep that you were going to bring to sacrifice at the temple. And you know that when you came that you would have to go and visit, you know, the, the place where the priests would examine sheep. And in a lot of cases, those corrupt priests would simply disqualify your sheep for all sorts of reasons. So people stopped bringing them. And in its place, you'd have to buy temple sheep authorized already in advance by the rabbis, and uh, they would say, these are good. Now, you couldn't actually go there and simply say, how much, and then pay for it with your money. You'd have to first go to the table of a group of people called the money changers. So they take your money, and they change it into temple money, which is kind of like holy money. And then they'd rip you off at the table of the money changers. They didn't give you appropriate value for your money. Then you take your temple money and then you buy temple sheep and they were overpriced. So you get ripped off not once, but twice. Now you have to imagine how this system was a money-making system. I mean, it was fascinating. And if you're especially poor and you're living on the edge, I mean, you think about the sacrifice that would have been required for you to sacrifice your sheep there during, during Passover. Now, Mark also mentions that they sold doves there and doves were required for the purification of women and they were also required for the cleansing of skin diseases, and they were used especially by the poor who couldn't afford one of the sheep, so this is all that you could afford and you would be allowed to buy a dove. But even that dove would have been an overpriced dove. So I hope you can see the problem. On the one hand, you've got a temple system which disallows anyone who's a seeker after God who belongs to the Gentiles say, I'd like to hear about the God of Israel. I want to hear about his great deeds. I want to, in some fashion, be a part of this worship of the one true God. They're forbidden. Then here's the other issue. If you're a member of Israel, you have to condescend to allow yourself to be ripped off a number of times and to be bled of money before you can go to worship. So Jesus on this Monday, simply after he's cursed the fig tree, I've already made this, is a symbol of a corrupt temple system. He's cursed them and said, may no one eat fruit from you again. Now he walks into the temple and he's roaring as he comes. He's kicking over the, you know, the tables of the money changers, the place where all the corruption is going on. I mean, there's money flying uh, through the temple. And by the way, it's not in the temple. The, the, the system of, of changing your money and then buying sheep in which you have to believe there's hundreds, thousands of them uh, being sold. I mean, they're all over the place. I mean, where are they? And the answer is they're in the court of the Gentiles. Uh, they're in the place where Gentiles are invited to come and worship, but there's no place for worship because, I mean, all this stuff is going on. And uh, so, you know, it, buying and selling and people haggling and shouting and everything else, not a place of worship at all. So Jesus roars and we, we read about this. He says, my house, he says, in this court of the Gentiles, in this place where buying and selling is happening and people are shouting back to another, Jesus roars over top of all of them and says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, not merchandise, but a house of prayer for all nations, he says, for all nations, for all the peoples on the face of the earth. And what he's doing here, in fact, he's quoting from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 56, three to seven. I'd like to read that passage. Listen carefully as it's being read. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am only a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. 
their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations." (laughs) Well, you have to get that sense that the the very existence of the temple, the, the building of the temple, was there to invite the lost and the aimless and the hopelessly sinners and those hopelessly uh, disconnected from God to find a place into the presence of God. It was their first step. Indeed, if you think about the the very first temple that was built, and it was built by King Solomon, um, and uh, this is what Solomon prayed when he dedicated that temple. And I'm reading here from 2 Chronicles 6, 32 and 33. This also is important to hear. Solomon prays, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear from heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Solomon's prayer, when he actually dedicated the place, he had in mind also that the foreigner would be invited. But by the time of Jesus, the place was a money-making venture. It was filled with a corrupt priesthood who no longer loved the God of Israel. They were not only making money, but they were excluding the rabble and those not invited because they were already sick of the Romans occupying their country, and they certainly didn't want any more foreigners around. Just get out was the message. And Jesus walks into this place where foreigners would have or should have been invited and sees merchandise being sold and says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, and then walks through the place kicking over the, the, the tables of the money changers, and he's got a whip and he's driving them out of the door, and everyone's shouting and there's tumult everywhere, and you think, what chaos and what a mess! What in the world is he up to here? Now, a great many Bible teachers have called this action of Jesus that was done on Monday, uh, they call it, you know, the cleansing of the temple. Cleansing of the temple. And it's an interesting perspective of what Jesus did. Because if it had been Jesus' intention to purify the temple in some way and make it holy for God, I would have to say he utterly failed because it wasn't long after that, after he had done all these things, that they would have set up the tables again and things would have carried on just as before. He did not manage to cleanse the temple. If that had been his goal and perspective, well, then surely he had failed utterly. And I would even add to that, did you know that this wasn't even the first time he did this? I mean, John's gospel tells us that in the first year of his ministry, when he first visited Jerusalem, he had done this once before. And so clearly, you know, here he is three years later, And it's just the way it had been there. No temple had been cleansed. I don't think that Jesus was cleansing the temple. He didn't come to the temple that day, you know, like a reformer. He's going to reform Judaism. In fact, he comes to the temple not as a reformer at all. He comes as a prophet. And a prophet does something very different. A prophet comes to announce the will of God, and the prophet comes also to denounce all evil that he sees, and a prophet might also come to announce that because evil has been pervasive and because it simply carries on, the prophet announces that God's patience has come to an end and that there is a curse on the place, and I'm going to say that's what Jesus has done. When he overthrows the table, he's announcing that God is displeased And the time for turning is now over. God's displeasure is about to be poured out onto this place. So, you know, you imagine this. I mean, the whole idea of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is get rid of the leaven, get rid of the evil. Jesus comes and says there's nothing but leaven in this place. He curses the fig tree, which is a symbol of the temple. Then he walks into the temple and kicks over the money changers' tables and says, there's the evil right there, and I'm bringing a curse down on it. So that's the whole idea behind it. And I, and I have to stop here and, and, and think for a while and say, You know, don't you think there's a point of of application in all of that that can be real for our own experiences in churches today? 
And what I mean by that is that, I mean, you think about it, how many times is it that a local church will simply do things for themselves? They're not reaching out to the poor, the disenfranchised, the needy, the alienated from God, and opening the door wide and saying, I, we're going to provide for you so that you can find access into the presence of God. I mean, when that form of thinking is absent, then even in a local church today, we have the very same perspective that the Sadducees and the Pharisees of Jesus' day had. Jesus denounced them, and if we have the same attitude, don't you think that he would also denounce us? So that's what happened on Monday. Now, there's one more event on Monday, and, and, I, and I need to just admit here at the outset that Bible teachers are at, you know, are at some disagreement as to whether the event that I'm about to mention happened on Monday. But, you know, my best reading of it, you know, and I know that only John mentions this in his gospel, but I do think it did happen on Monday. Um, so I'm reading here from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 23. It says, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now that's it's an interesting statement right there. So you, you have to wonder, if you read that and you don't understand the context of everything that's happened on Monday, you might read what John is saying and it just kind of goes whew, right over our heads and have no idea what that was all about. But it connects, doesn't it? So it turns out that of all the you know, crowds and crowds of people that, that filled Jerusalem, that among those crowds there were plenty of Gentiles, and here were a group of Greeks. Now you have to imagine, these group of Greeks would have been there at, to some level would have been observing Passover events, but they would not have been allowed to go anywhere near the temple. And the place that should have been designated for them had now been cut off because all of the selling of merchandise was there. So I've got to wonder about you know, the condescension of these group of men who simply said, well, if that's how it's going to be, I'm out of here. But they didn't do that. Um, I, I find it fascinating that they were there. And if you know something about how the early church began to grow uh, after the, these events, um, you, you should know that it grew among a people that were called God-fearers. These were Gentiles who had been told, you can't be a part of the community of God's people unless you're first circumcised, that is males are, and then secondly, that you give yourself to Jewish dietary restrictions, that you have a diet that is completely foreign to you, and that thirdly, that you also cease all connection with your Gentile friends and relatives. In other words, I mean, you have to just go completely out of your community. And for most of these Gentiles, they would have loved the God of Israel, but that was a step too far. They just couldn't go there. And so there's this group of people that when the, you know, when the early church first began, these were the very people they targeted. They said, God has opened a door for you, and it is through Christ by faith. And what we find here on this Monday is that there are a group of Greeks that are wandering around in Jerusalem, and they find Philip, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. I think they found Philip. I mean, Philip is Jewish, but Philip, the name Philip is itself a Greek name. So they may have said, look, if his name is Philip, he's going to listen to us, and we're not allowed near the temple, but we want to see the miracle worker from Galilee. We think he's a man of God. Can we go see him? So that's what happens. And the minute Jesus hears this, now you have to assume they did go see him, but that's not what John is after. The minute Jesus hears about these Greeks seeking after him, this is what Jesus says. He says, now the hour has come. The Son of Man will be glorified. And, uh, and, and so here I'm reading from John 12, 24. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus is actually saying, look, if I give myself up now, if I become the Passover lamb, I die, I will bear so much fruit, and it will be among Gentiles and people who have been excluded from the people of God throughout history. So let me end with an illustration. 
if you're from the prairies, from the Canadian prairies, the, the great wheat belt that stretches for, you know, so many kilometers across our country, if you know something about farming, it's a really remarkable thing. You've got grain farmers that have got these large tracts of land, and uh, every spring they go out seeding. And if you've never, if you had never heard about seeding, um, you might think it's the most ridiculous thing a person can do, because you take this perfectly good seed, and uh, you know you put it into a, a you know a, a a seeder, which is you know these hoppers that will plant it into the earth. And you'd say, well, you could have ground up this you know this grain. And you could have made bread out of and all sorts of foodstuffs, but instead of doing that and selling it on the market, you rather spread it out over this vast, vast tract of land and you plant it into the earth. Basically, it dies there. You'll never be able to recover that expensive wheat that you've put into the ground and now you've lost from the earth. What a silly farmer that would take this expensive seed that he has and spread it all over where it can never be found again. But of course, we know why he does that, because if he allows it to fall into the earth and die, it will produce a harvest so many more times productive than the seed that fell into the ground. And Jesus compares himself to that. I have come because um, I have come to reach out to people who are estranged from God. I have found that the people of God have had corrupt hearts and they were unwilling to receive me. But all around them were people who were hungry after me, and I have come to fall into the earth and die. I have come to Jerusalem to give myself as the sacrificial Passover lamb. I have come to this place to be killed and to be laid in a tomb. And if that happens, there will be a vast harvest among the Gentiles. That's the promise that he makes. So that's Jesus' perspective of why he had come to Jerusalem. Yeah, he was orchestrating all of the events that were about to happen. He was going to make sure that he would die at Passover time and that his sacrifice would be understood to be the great deliverance from the slavery of sinfulness and alienation from God. But the revolution that he was bringing was far greater than the Jewish people. It was a revelation that was going to touch more people than we could ever imagine. That's why Jesus came to Jerusalem. That's part of the story of the journey to the cross. That's why we celebrate Easter as this great focal point of the Christian faith. Hey, thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada. I always love it when you join me, and I hope you're learning and you're growing and you're coming to appreciate Christ as never before. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.